Welcome to our Indie Street Chat. The members of Bloodhound Picks and an occasional guest give their no BS experiences with current aspects of the industry. Join me this time as I talk with Llewellyn Grief, the producer of The Unfamiliar. We talk about everything from what it's like making a film like The Unfamiliar, even to producing in the modern era and for independent cinema. It was a pleasure. He is very knowledgeable and very friendly, and I'd love to have him on again to chat more. But I hope you enjoy as much as I did. Thank you for... Thank you for being a part of this, Llewellyn, and joining me to talk about The Unfamiliar, which is coming out this week. No, no problem, Craig. Thank you so much for, for having me and, and supporting the film. Yeah. Um, so just to start off, we'd love to hear kind of your history, get a full introduction of you know, who you are and how you came about being the yeah. producer of the film. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I think the, the, the abbreviated version was I, I started out in, in tech initially. Um, I had a, I've always had a passion for stories and production, but you know I was I was young in, in South Africa, and getting into the film industry was not really regarded as a real job in those days. Yeah. So um, so I took another route and I went into into tech and then um, sort of developed through that. And through those years, I did teaching at universities, I did project management roles. Um, and then I emigrated to the UK about 16 years ago. And then along that journey, I, I sort of started my own editing company on the side. And then I was just, my passion grew and grew and grew. And then one day I just decided, well, you know, I, I'd love to do what I love and call it my job. And then I pivoted away from what I had as my career initially and then went back to film school. And I studied here in London at Metropolitan Film Studios. And then shortly after that, I was hungry and I wanted to get going in it. And I wanted to build a business in filmmaking because it's after all called, you know, the film business. Yeah. <laughs> um, and wanted to, you know, build a sound business out of it. And, and, the, and the key to building a really good business, in my opinion, is the hardest part is finding the right business partner. Um, and then I was luckily introduced to Hank Pretorius through my wife, actually, because they knew each other back from school and mutual friends. Um, and that was, that was the start and the, the awesome beginning of, of Dark Matter Studios. I met Hank in late 2012. We launched Dark Matter Studios shortly after that with our first film together in 2013 called Leading Lady, which is a romantic comedy. And then thereafter, we just sat down and worked out a vision on what we would like to achieve as a company and primarily, you know, creating wealth through content, which means the entire process, you know, from development, yeah. finance, production, distribution, IP and all that. Um, and it's wonderful. You know, I, I, I say when, when you're in a, in a business with, with a partner like Hank, that is not only creative, he also understands business. Um, and I'm on the business side and I'm not just business. I also respect and understand the creative. So in that way, you know, no one's, not one guy's trying to do the other guy's job. Um, which means everything we set out to do. So, you know, Hank would be in charge of the creative and he would make sure that that's right. And I'd be in charge of the, the production side and the business and, and the sort of finance. And then when we, get to the point where we go, okay, we're going to commission this. We each have a very clear sort of structure set out to what I need to do and what he needs to do. And then that's how we go through our projects. And we've, we've done several projects before the unfamiliar, but the unfamiliar was our first full English language, you know, international project. And also probably our, what most widely distributed projects, if I look at North America, you know, we, yeah. um, we spoke to our distributor on Friday and throughout the platforms, you know, throughout the pay per view and the digital platforms that we are premiering on, we are, we were sort of made available to over a hundred million homes in the United States. I mean, it was just like, I can still get goosebumps when I think about that. I mean, it was just phenomenal. You know, it's such a privilege to have done this. So, so that's the long and the short of it. And that's how. I'm producing this film, and and that's how Hank is um, writing and directing the film. No, yeah, and it's great. I um, I'm actually chatting with you from the states. I remember, um, I'm well. I've been up here, and I've my parents' home, and looked at kind of the movies for rent on Dish or stuff like that. And I, yeah. I've seen it pop up a ton. Oh wow! And yeah, so it's been a real pleasure to kind of see it. Oh and really? Like, what, oh, this weekend? Yeah, yeah. Oh man, that's so cool. I'm I'm actually going to say to you like. Take a video and send me the WhatsApp video. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's just I, so, 
you know, it's so exciting when, when you hear these things happening. But like, you know, when you're in your own territory, like, you know, when we release in the UK in September, I'll see it everywhere because I'm sitting here in the UK. But when people tell you, because I have some family in California tell me as well, oh, I've seen it here. And then I have another um, friend in Boston. Oh, it's popped up here. And I'm like, oh, it's so cool. Send me out. I want to see it. You know, it's like I was saying to Hank on Friday, we sat having lunch together on the, on the sort of release day and go, oh, man, I wish I could just see what it looks like to the user on that side. Yeah. So I'm really glad you say that. So it's, it's you know, it, it is appearing everywhere. And that's wonderful. Thank you, Craig. Oh, no problem at all. Yeah, I'll definitely send you a video of, of it. <laughs> no. So, great, great. so for, um, because for this process, the way you're talking about it and the way you're dealing with this or working with Dark Matter Studios, it seems like, in, you know, as you've already kind of explained, you're wearing a lot more hats than, you know, especially in the indie, I guess, film world, you are wearing a lot more hats than just like, what the yeah. general image of, yeah. it is of a producer for kind of the regular audience member. What all does, does that really entail? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Um, that's that's really a good question, actually. It's the first time someone's asked us that question, um, and I'd love to answer it. You know, the nice thing is, so if you think about when you start a business, so Hank and I started out a business as two business people, but even though he has this really talented craft at writing and directing and storytelling and my craft is producing and raising finance, it's it comes down to your business element still, you know. So if I it, say we started a company that was selling coffee, the the business principles are the same, you know. So we'd be, I mean, but also I think you know the coffee industry is probably a bit a little bit easier and not as I mean I'm I'm not no disrespect to the coffee industry, but it's it's not as comp- competitive and as tough, you know. Yeah. Where the film business and the entertainment business and the music business, you and I both know, and I mean you know you you've got this awesome blog and you write about stuff, you know how cutthroat it is out there, yeah. how difficult it is, how much risk risk is involved and how you, to get someone's attention, you know, in America to get your movie distributed, you basically have to light yourself on fire and run in the streets. You know, yeah. it's, it's <laughs> so, so tough. But we're, we're, we're wearing those different hats, I think is a massive advantage. Even though, you know, you'd think to yourself, well, you know, because you think of it two ways. Hank is this, you know, super creative can go, well, a studio can hire me and then I work for the studio and I go, oh, as a producer, company can hire me as a producer and then they give me the money and I produce it. Mm-hmm. Now that's nice and it's, 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 it's comfortable. And there are some guys that are doing that and doing a great job at that. But when you do it on your own and in the independent business, you don't have that safety. Net. So as a business owner, a co-business owner with Hank, we go, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to go get money from private investors. So now we have the same duty of care to those investors as somebody at a hedge fund would have. It's not, oh, you've invested in the film business. Oh, let's, you know, hope for the best. If it doesn't work, sorry. Not very, not many people are going to give you money. Maybe your uncles and your aunts, but you only want to be able to do that once and then you're not going to have any more money. <laughs> so that's what makes it exciting, exciting and tough at the same time. Because I mean, you know, the guys that are employed by the studios, it's a bit easier because it's not really their thing. And sure, they can get fired, but they can go to somewhere else. But for us, you know, we, we answer to ourselves and to our investors every single day. Um, and, and I think that's what makes it great. And being in the independent space, because you don't have an abundance of money and access to distribution, you know, on a large scale necessarily as quickly as a studio, you have to really be even more creative in my opinion. You have to work so hard. You have to try and get through the noise. You know, you've got a, you know, we've got a horror film now. We're going, okay, how do we get through the noise? How do we get it seen? How do we get it noticed? I mean, if, if you think about it, Craig, how many thousands of films are entered into film festivals every year? Yeah. And, you know, seen on, you know, go through past, sort of past people's eyes onto the back catalog. There's like thousands of films out there. And then if you think about an avid film goer, you know, they're watching, you know, say, say an avid film goer will go to the cinema three to five times a year. Then they've got a few things to choose from. They've got the big tent poles, they've got the franchises, and there's a few independents. Um, so it's, it's really, really competitive. But being in the independent space and being the, company co-owner makes you look at it in such a strategic way that that you are you're forced to understand the entire process from from the story from the distribution from who's going to watch it and the most important thing is the audience 
you know, who are we making this film for? And that's and that's and that's where Hank is brilliant. You know, every film we've done together, and even the films he's done before me, he always sits and he'll, he'll go, okay, um, who am I making this for? And do I understand that audience member? Mm-hmm. And it's incredible to see. And this and this was quite daunting for us because. You know, Hank lived in America for several years. I've been going to America for a long time. I have, I have a lot of you know, family there. But still, you know, the, the audience changes and shifts so often. So with this, we tried to be true to the audience within the horror genre. Because I think the horror audience is one of my favorite audiences. I, I've never seen such a, a cool audience, such an engaging audience, um, and an audience that cares so much about the genre and cares so much about each other. I, I agree completely, and I think... That brings up a uh, kind of a great segue to talk about the the movie itself, the unfamiliar, and how you know you were. So, yeah. if you kind of want to explain before we get more into it, explain a little bit about what it is or what it's about, and you know, without giving it any spoilers that you necessarily want to, <laughs> but sure. No, 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 sure, sure. And I mean, you, you you've seen it now, right? Yes, yes, I have. Oh, great, great. So, um, I mean. You know, those, those who go out there and search for it and watch it, you know, whether they're watching the trailer or reading the, the synopsis, you know, it, it, it follows a British army doctor, Izzy, who comes back from war. Um, and she thinks that she's got PTSD, but then she discovers that there's a more daunting sort of malevolence at work, making the life that she knew before she went to war unfamiliar. You know, so she comes back and, and, and it's, it's a bit odd now and it's not the way it was. Um, and what's beautiful about it is what I, what I love about the story. And, and it's going to sound like a bias, obviously, because we, we made it, but like what I love about it is, is that character journey of a mother for a family. You know, mm-hmm. Hank and I have always had very strong role models, models as, as mothers. You know, we have phenomenal mothers. I have an incredible sister. Hank is an incredible sister. So we've always been surrounded by these incredible women um, and how hard it is to keep things together. You know, if you, if you yeah. just think about it, if you think about your mom and your grandmother and how the one thing they want to do is for the family to get along, to love each other. And then they've got to do so many other things as well. You know, they've got to, they've got to work. They've got to keep everyone happy. They've got to, you know, keep um, everyone you know, within peace and the family. And, and then you still got to try and manage your job. And, and there's that instinct of just wanting to keep everyone together. I mean, I remember when I was a kid and I was really afraid, like I'd always want my mother there, you know, because yeah. she will make me feel safe. So I think when, and, and I think that that was the, the, the strong subtext throughout the film. And then obviously the beautiful thing about the horror genre is you can use the horror translation and the, and the tool of the horror, you know, filmmaker that which Hank used so nicely to play with that. Even though there's horrific things happening, I feel that anyone can relate to what it's like to keep a family together. You know, some families don't make it. Some families break up. Um, some families um, are great, but then they lose someone in the family or some families break up and they start a new family. Um, and this is always tough. You know, it's, it's, it's say what you want and whether you're young or old, um, the last thing you want is your family to, to fight. You know, we want that to, to be good. And then imagine coming back home or, you know, like, for example, I always say to my cousins, Thanksgiving is such a great holiday in the U.S. Yeah. And imagine coming to, you know, the worst thing on Thanksgiving is if the whole family fights and it's yeah. horrible and <laughs> no one speaks and <clears throat> all you want is a, a great time and, and to share that. And I think obviously it's, it's a horror and, and I love the suspense and I, I love the way Hank takes all the characters on a journey and I can relate to it and I know it's an easy story but but it really comes down to that it comes down to keeping that family together and and if I may ask Greg what what did, what did you see it as like what did you enjoy about the film without giving away too much of course yeah no of course no I actually um, would kind of back that a lot I like the because it wasn't just your so it wasn't us without giving away too much a standard family dynamic where you had a stepmother and but there was still that love for it so it wasn't like that Oh, you have the wicked stepmother, or you know, however, and the daughter doesn't like her because she's yeah. the stepmom. Yeah. There is actually kind of it's a new age, I guess, family. But I love the, I guess, the focus on the characters that um, the unfamiliar did, and that really bring to it, and that you know, it it wasn't just these, yeah. you know, and it really kind of deals with these, you know, as you said, PTSD, and it deals with these other aspects that yeah. are deeper than um, 
again, without giving too much away, your standard or a lot of these other, yeah. um, you know, movies in that style with being as vague as Correct. I can. Correct. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. I, I, I'm actually going to quote you on that on the way you just explained it. I was like, that's brilliant. So no, no, you, you, you actually got it spot on. And, and, you know, and that, and that's what is great about this kind of film because, you know, of course, the, you know, I'm heavily involved in the casting process as well. Um, I try and sort of get the cast that Hank really wants. And as producer, my job is to try and get to them as quick as possible. And then the first thing I try and achieve is get the, you know, director in front of the cast. And then it's sort of, that's it. Then I go and do the deal and they go and speak about the creative. And I think that's what, what was great for myself and Hank. You know, everyone brought such a great element to the film. I mean, Jemima, Chris, Rebecca, Harry McMillan, Hunt, Rachel, you know, everyone had an element because there's not a lot of characters in the film. Yeah. Um, you know, it was very important to get the right people for it, you know. So if when there are less characters, you have to make sure the characters are right because, you know, if you have a lot of characters, you can usually cut around a few people that aren't there throughout the whole time if it doesn't work. But, I mean, the performances for us were wonderful, you know, yeah. like – you know, Jemima's character, um, you know, she took us through that journey. She came across as a strong woman, but as a caring woman. And and those elements were really good for us. And, and I think horrors, my favorite horrors besides, you know, ones we work with are ones where the, the, the creators have taken care of the character and they've yeah. taken care of the story. Because it's easy to focus on just the horror stuff and just jump the scares. But it's even better when you really care about the characters. And that's what, that's what I also enjoyed about it. Yeah, no, I mean, myself too included, exactly. <laughs> so Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, no, so I'd love to kind of hear a little bit more, I guess, on that, the, the process itself with casting and with kind of getting everything set up. So, um, obviously, you know, casting is, is very interesting, and I suppose casting is – has changed quite a bit since we made the film and, and since we find yeah. ourselves in this, in the, the world post, you know, COVID-19. Um, I, th I think casting is going to be even more challenging now. It's always been challenging because if you think about it, <clears throat> there's only, you know, one Jemima, there's only one Christine. Um, and if I think about, you know, cast members, they get offered several projects and then they've got to choose one that they want to do as their next project or the next thing in their career. So I think it's difficult from both sides, but, but from our side, um, you know, when, when we cast, we try and cast everyone. We try and cast, you know, the cast members, we try and cast the crew because everyone plays a very important role. Yeah. But with, with the unfamiliar, we had, we had cast from different places, you know, like Jemima, um, actually lives in France most of the time. Uh, Rebecca travels around quite a lot. Uh, Chris is originally from Scandinavia, but lives here as well. So for us, it was nice to, to get people from different places who brought something different to the film. But the process for casting is always about getting to the cast member first. I mean, you know, cause as you know, how the system works, there's a lot of gatekeepers. You've got agents yeah. and managers, yeah. etc. Then getting them, getting them to like the material. Um, respond to the material and then eventually the most important thing, get in front of the director and they start speaking. And I find usually every time I've managed to, throughout the films Hank and I've made together, when you, you get to the person, you finally get to the manager and the agent and they get to the cast member. Once they sit and meet the director and they buy into the director's vision and they can see what the director sees, that that's the best thing. You know, I always wonder like, Oh, we can't speed the process up, but I also understand why <laughs> the process is there. Otherwise, they get bombarded, you know. And it's, you know, I can imagine being spammed. Um, so it, it, it's tough, but it's it is it's not the easiest thing. And um, I always I always say to young producers, you know, it's it's a hard process, but it's it's very important. And the best thing you can do is try and get your the director in front of the cast member as soon as possible. Because as soon as they start speaking, um, you know, that's when the producer steps off, goes in the background and makes a deal with the agent because, the, you know, the cast member, yes, money's important, all those elements are important, but the cast member also, they're building their portfolio. So they, that's why they need to speak to the director and go, okay, this is the next thing for me. And then a director's building his portfolio going, I've worked with these cast members in this level of cast. So that process is always... You know, it's, it's, it can be can be difficult, um, and you know, the bigger the cast member, the more complex it is. But I think um, 
with us, if I look back and I look back at the people we've cast in the past, we we've, we've fortunately always used to not give up on something. You know, you, mm-hmm. I, I always, I'm a firm believer of you, you, you get what you focus, you get what you focus on. So we, we try not to use a shotgun approach and, you know, send out to yeah. five cast members. We'll go, this is the person we want. We study everything about the person and we focus on that until we know. And, and I find that sort of curated approach um, really assists us a lot with our casting process. I, I hope that answers your question. No, yeah, that's perfect. I think, yeah, it really, it really shows. And I mean, it shows that, that care in your company of, you know, wanting to make it right for your oh, project. Thank you yeah. so much. Um, you brought up a great point, and I know we're kind of um, ending our time shortly, but I'd love to hear about what it's like getting a film out in 2020 with COVID and with everything else. That's a great question. You know, the thing is, just just before, we, we were very fortunate because no one saw the, the pandemic coming in. We had just finished um, doing our deal with Vertical um, in the U.S. for the unfamiliar. Came back from LA in January, got back to London, and then both Hank and I have a mutual friend whose wedding we attended in South Africa. We flew out there, um, and then everything started changing, and we suspected, like, wow, what's going on here? And then Hank came back to London, I was in South Africa, and initially we had quite a um, big cinema release planned for The Unfamiliar, you know, like the distributors loved it, um, our local territories is the UK, we were going to go out on 200 theatrical screens, which is a great release. Um, you know, a vertical plan to go out on a few screens in the US. We've got screens in South Africa because historically we've, we've always made films that get to the screen, you know, and, and we are proud of that because Hank and I both have a love, not just for content, but we have a love for cinema. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. if take, take everything away as personal people, it's funny, like what Hank and I do for fun is we go watch movies. We love yeah. movies, you know, so, um, and then that all changed, you know, but it didn't just change for us, Craig. It changed for everyone, yeah, yeah. you know. So what was interesting was when, when the lockdown happened, Hank and I, you know, we jumped on a, on a Zoom call um, and we said, well, okay, well, this, this is an odd time, but it's odd for everyone. You know, it's not just us that can't go to theaters. It's everyone, you know. So it's companies that have made films for $100 million and hundred thousand dollars you know it's companies that have already put marketing spend behind films so because we didn't know how to steer the landscape and i don't think anyone really did all we could do was go back to the basics and the basics was we've got a film a we're very fortunate because the film's finished you know there were a lot of companies that were caught like mid-production or you know like started production and it was and everything was stopped so and and and, i mean that's so hardcore and and i feel so sorry for those people but luckily we were in the fortunate position we had finished the film but we were also in the fortunate position that we didn't start spending on marketing just yet but then we thought okay well the basics is everyone's going to be online now everyone's going to be on digital but it doesn't mean like we have an advantage now. It means everyone's going to be online, you know, so everyone else as well. So the studios are going to go online. The big independents are going to go online. But everything else is going online. You know, bands are going to go online. Shows are going to go online. So if you think about how the attention economy was suddenly heightened for every, everything online, it didn't make it easier for us, but it did make it more accessible for us because now suddenly people – we're consuming more content online. Okay. I mean, if you just think about, uh, I, I say this to my wife, uh, we, we were staying with my, my in-laws um, during the lockdown. And during that time, how many you know younger generation people actually then took the time to put their parents onto Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and you know, get them on there when they never had the time to do it? So suddenly there was this new part of the generation that has now been digitized. I mean, Netflix were talking about over 16 million new subscribers during lockdown. So then obviously the audience didn't didn't disappear. They just moved. So now everyone's just watching stuff at home. So then Hank and I said, well, you know, we we, we can't go out on 200 screens now. So now we have to make a big noise online. And how do we do that? And that's where, again, the independent spirit comes and you go, well, we don't have that big splash now, but neither does anyone else. You know, we're not going to be able to be on a billboard or a bus, but neither would the next other film. So now we're sort of on an even playing field and we have to be very clever with our story. We have to be very clever with our campaign and our assets. And then what we did, um, and and you've probably been following along with Twitter and, um, Mm. you know, Facebook and everything else. We just worked out a very 
thought out strategy and Hank and I sat, it was a Sunday afternoon and we said, okay, this is the plan. What assets are we going to create? Who's our audience? Who are we going to target? How are we going to do the PR? And obviously you've met Alicia now. She's incredible. Yeah. You know, she, she's got a PR company in South Africa. We've done several films with her. And then we said, so look, we want you to help us with the PR for the world because now whether you're a PR company in the US, UK or South Africa, everyone's just getting the PR information via email. So it's like, let's just do it ourselves and then we did and then um myself hank alicia and a team um we have another company called Southern media headed up by jay who's actually the editor of the film okay. and we just worked out this massive campaign and we were very focused we put a team together of special you know social media experts and we worked around the clock you know we were like going okay you look after twitter you look after facebook you look after um you know instagram like we're going to design a website. Like we need to create a bunch of assets. Let's make it so that there's an asset releasing every week. Um, let's do this big build up to the trailer and then, you know, hope that it all pays off. And, you know, with social media, it's so tough because you don't know how the algorithms favor you anymore. Yeah. It's like, do you have to spend more money to get attention? What do you do? But I find, you know, we learn so much throughout this. So in a way, we came out the other side understanding marketing a whole different way and maybe this is the way marketing is going to be going forward. So to answer your question, Craig, you know, we just didn't sit on our hands and go, oh, poor us. Oh, man, we lost the cinemas. Let's just go to the investors and say, hey, guys, bad luck, you know, force majeure. We were like, no way. This is a time for us to grow, to learn, to innovate. Um, and we just started creating content. And Hank went and created these incredible assets and, you know, EPKs and background things. And I was speaking to teams on how to get Facebook to talk to Instagram properly. And, and, you know, it was like a bit of a baptism of fire. But then the day the trailer came out, and I think you, you saw that because we already engaged with you back then. Yeah. You know, the trailer came out on several platforms. There were several YouTube channels sharing it. There were comments, there were shares, and it was, it was just insane. You know, we've never yeah. had that on a, on a traditional marketing campaign. And that goes to show like maybe traditional, you don't put as much effort or maybe traditional wasn't as effective and, and it's nothing against traditional, but certainly everything has changed. But I must say, and, 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 and let me give credit to, you know, I mean, the team worked really hard and Alicia has been phenomenal, her team and Hank or everyone, but the horror community itself, I've, I've never seen a community that supports the, the filmmakers in that community and the people in that community so much. You know, there's a hashtag on, on Twitter that's a hashtag horror community, a hashtag horror family. Yeah. And I thought it's just another hashtag, you know, because you're so jaded with all these hashtags. Yeah. <laughs> it's like legit. Like you really like, I say to Hank, you're like, I feel part of this horror family. Like you almost want to just keep making things for the horror family. And, and that's what I, I mean, you know, you've got reviewers out there and people are going to review things. And it's really tough when you get reviews. But I think the horror family is almost like, they sort of, they decide whether they like it or not, and it's theirs to decide on, opposed to, you know, big reviewers who are reviewing war movies and then also review horror. The horror family, almost like they keep it to them like within the family, and and that that is something that we've experienced, and it's also a very intelligent community. You know, they're very, it's a very tolerant community, and they know how hard things are. So I don't know if it's because it's such a big genre, or because it's been so long standing, or maybe you can give me a, a bit more insight into the psychology of why this horror community is so good. But I can tell you now, you know, our 110% effort on the side of the marketing, our wonderful partnership and support and effort from Vertical, you know, and, you know, people in the US, our sales company, Scoundrel, which is headed by Myriad, everyone pushed so hard. But it was wonderful to see this this virtual community of horror people supporting us as well. And I, I must say, I've never seen that before. It's been phenomenal. No, that's yeah, great. And it kind of, I mean, it proves your resilience. And I think that's one of those things that you're really seeing, or we are really seeing now is like who's willing to innovate and who's willing to move forward. And then, you know, there's the other yeah. companies that are trying to maintain an older way that may not, well, probably will not, you know, Go, we will never go back to in a way. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and it's like it's like there's this English English saying that's uh you know the, the 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 queen queen is dead long live the queen. It's it almost feels like that. It's just it's not kind of way. It's just changed. And um, we have a, a guy that really gives us great advice. His name Stephen Follows, and I don't know if you follow him. He's got a, he's got a blog. He's got the most incredible analysis of the film industry i'd recommend you follow it but and he just said and he gave us this nugget of advice in the beginning Stephen said llewellyn okay. what 
if if everyone's doing this thing right now with films, don't do it. Oh. Do completely the opposite. If it, if you know if the studios are doing this, do something else. If these guys are doing this, do something else. It's like you're now competing with people buying clothes on Amazon, watching tickets, and why would they buy your movie? See it as like how are you going to get in front of those consumers? And it was great advice. You know, it, it takes that like, romantic film thing away, but you go, okay, if I'm focusing on how do I get this in front of an audience and doing it in a different way, that might work. And um, it did so far. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, if you don't follow him, he's, he's a great guy. I'll, I'll send you the link. He's got this um, amazing blog and it's all backed by like real data, you know, because a lot of times things about film is like one website says this, how much did it cost? I know this, this, but Steven's website's great. So, and I think that was part of our unconventional plan as well. We went to different avenues and just not your normal film avenues. We looked at the data as well. Um, yeah. And we had to reinvent ourselves and we, we just like you that so far it looks like it's working, but, uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question. No, yeah, it's perfect. And um, I mean, kind of a great way to wrap it up. I mean, I'd love to read his blog more. But um, yeah, so for yeah, the, for those listening, how do we find you um, through any sort of social media, through your company? And then um, if you want to... Yeah, great. Yeah. So Exactly. Yeah, sure. So, uh, obviously, uh, unfamiliar movie at unfamiliar movie is everything, or, you know, from Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, is unfamiliar Instagram. Then we've got the unfamiliar movie website, which for the real horror fans, I really recommend it because the website's broken into two parts. It's the film and the crew, and then it's the law and the mythology, which is quite nice. You know, it goes into the detail of our concept art and, the, you know, the, the soundscapes and what we did there. And then Henk is uh, Henk L. Pretorius on his Twitter, and I'm at Llewellyn. Um, but yeah, anywhere where we get support or, you know, fans, we really, really appreciate it. And and mostly, I think, you know, if, I'm sure people can, in the U.S., if they, they search for the unfamiliar on their respective platform or, cap, you know, cable company, that they, they, they should find it. But, but other than that, yeah, they can just check us online, and we appreciate the support. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. And I... Um hate that we have the time crunch because I'd love to chat more. So if we could ever have you back on again. Later. No, I know. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it, no, I, I, I think, I think when Hank and I, when, when traveling goes back to normal, we're going to come to the States and we should just, you know, chat about it in, in a studio somewhere over, over a beer or a coffee. It'll be great. Yeah, that sounds great. No, but thank you so much for joining me. And yeah, it was a pleasure. I really appreciate it. And thank you so much for the continued support and, and convey the same to your colleagues. Hank and I are really grateful. Thank you, Craig, and have a wonderful day. You too. Bloodhound Picks Podcast is part of the Morbidly Beautiful Podcast Network. Produced by Josh Lee, Craig Drum, and Kyle Hintz. Music by Raymond Seed. Editing by Kyle Hintz.